us thank you for bearing with us this morning as we have gone through uh, some technical issues. If you're watching this later online, you have no idea what it has taken to bring uh, this to you today. But we're believing that it is going to be uh, incredible and powerful as God speaks to us from His Word. I want to thank our, our tech team uh, for just their diligence in continuing to work uh, and ensure that every one of you that is watching uh, can be a part of the gathered people of God this morning. And uh, I believe that when we do that, uh, God imparts something fresh. There is something about gathering together, um, uh, being the body of Christ uh, that God wants to speak into and impart. So uh, we have a small group uh, here with us this morning. And um, look, if... If you're watching and you would like to be a part of uh, our TV audience, uh, well, I've always wanted to say that, so I'm just going to throw that in there. Uh, if, you, if you would like to be a part of the audience that gathers on a Sunday, just look, let us know. Send admin an email at our, uh, uh, you know, the, the email address. Yep, you all know what I'm talking about. Uh, you've been a part of the tech age for years now. I don't need to explain email. Do that so that we know that you'd be uh, like to be a part of this. Uh, for those of you who uh, maybe haven't, uh, been along the journey the last week or so, we have been reading a story uh, that John recounts uh, about an interaction that Jesus has with uh, uh, what the Bible would describe as a Samaritan woman. Um, and we have been kind of in a new series that we have called Deeper, believing that there is more uh, to the relationship that we have with Jesus uh, than simply functioning uh, as uh, you know, the day-to-day the -day or the week-to-week -week church. And it's incredible that in this season where the functionality of church has uh, been put on hold, actually God is drawing us into a deeper relational space with Him. Um, and so as a church, we are camping in this story uh, for the next few weeks, believing that God is speaking to us believing that God is uh, drawing us into a place where we um, know Him just a little bit more, uh, where we realize just a little bit more about Him. And uh, so I would, I would love just to welcome everyone who this morning is watching or maybe uh, at another time you have landed on this video or our podcast. Uh, I encourage you, listen with open ears and uh, I would not be surprised if God speaks to you. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for being with us today wherever we are. I want to thank you that you love us. Uh, you want to guide us. You want to speak to us. Most of all, uh, you want to have a, a real, genuine relationship with us. So, Lord, this morning, I pray that you would speak. Uh, I pray that you would, more than anything, draw us closer to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. So this story, uh, to give you a quick overview, uh, Jesus um, goes through this particular town and stops at a well. Uh, a woman comes out in the middle of the day uh, to get water from the well, and Jesus and her have this conversation. Uh, they have a conversation about, firstly, uh, the fact that she needs water to physically survive her life in the desert. But then Jesus uh, shifts kind of the, the direction of the conversation, and he uses the fact that they're talking about physical needs to address the reality that she has a spiritual need. And uh, he begins to uh, help her realize that she's been trying to satisfy this spiritual need with a religiosity or, or, or a, a functionality uh, rather than necessarily a relationship. And so he puts his finger on that and begins to reveal who he is and what the whole idea is about knowing Jesus. And in that demonstrates how uh, once and for all in, in Jesus, we can find the satisfaction that for all of us, uh, ultimately we crave uh, in, in our soul. And, and so I want to just pull out a couple of verses from that particular story this morning. If you are following along with a Bible uh, or you're on the online Bible, I want to pull out John 4, 11 to 15. Uh, it says, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. And those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. 
then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water. Later on in verse 21, Jesus says this. Jesus replies, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Sudden end to that verse, but then we're going to unpack that. Sorry. All right. So I want, to, I want to tell you a bit of a story this morning. I don't know if you've ever had a time in your life where you, you have realized how much you crave something. Um, before I got married, I used to uh, go on uh, what I would call boys' adventures uh, because I was definitely still a boy before I got married. That journey has absolutely made me realize that I need to be a man. And um, let me encourage all of you young men out there, do the journey. Start to take responsibility for yourself and your development before you maybe meet the woman that God has for you. It's always a good plan. Uh, but we used to uh, get together with a group of mates and we would go off on like, we would call these, these boys trips, these adventures, right? And we were pretty reckless and the goal of the trip was to almost make it without maybe actually articulating it, but to make it almost as reckless as we could, right? We were all into Bear grills at the time and the idea of surviving and, you know, forging our way through life and uh, was, was, you know, greatly resonating within us. And so we decided out of the blue uh, that this island that we had seen uh, off of the coast looked like an incredible place to go uh, for a camp out. Right, and uh, we had no experience, as many of you know from my other stories. I'm not a boating person. I don't boat. Um, you can tell by my use of that as a verb. Uh, but uh, so we, we're like, surely we can get out to the island. We surfed a lot, so we thought, you know, we could paddle somehow out there. Maybe if we just packed up some stuff and went, you know, it, we, we would be sweet. So uh, over the space of about a week or so, we designed this trip and we, we got a hold of, we hired and borrowed and begged a couple of sea kayaks. Um, none of us, there was four of us, none of us had ever been in sea kayaks before. But we're like, surely, you know, they can't be that difficult to, to operate. So we got sea kayaks and we packed them up. We had a tent in there and uh, some matches, but we're like, you know what? We're going to back ourselves to catch food, right? We're going we're gonna to back, so we packed our spearfishing equipment, but no actual food. Um, and look, we, we weren't completely naive. We did pack some water with us, um, but we're like, look, if we've got shelter covered, we back ourselves to make fire and, and catch food, right? That was part of the reckless nature of the trip and believing that we could, if, if, if the, the world completely, uh, you know, doomsday preppers unite, uh, we would be able to survive. And so the day that we set off, the ocean was relatively calm. You've got to remember that as, as growing up as surfers, calm and rough have you know, different meanings for different people. Uh, for us, calm was anything uh, that was you know, under the, the closure of a beach. So uh, the ocean was relatively calm and only two of us capsized our sea kayaks getting off of the beach um, out behind the waves. So that was an advantage. It meant that we still had two uh, kayaks of equipment that were dry. Uh, the, other, the other guys now had wet clothes clothing, but uh, they didn't have the tent, so that was fine. And I don't know how long it took us. The time just kind of disappears when you're out in the ocean, but eventually we landed on the island after somewhat navigating a reef that we didn't know existed and almost getting capsized in this reef as well. And, and we got out there and we were pumped. We were like, this is awesome. We're on this island, like it was castaway style, and um, set up our tent and we're like, awesome. Two, two guys were going to light the fire, and then we, we decided that uh, me and and someone else, we were going to go out and we were going to try to catch fish because we're like, this is how we're going to eat tonight. Anyway, I can't say there were a lot of fish. Um, and, and I can't exactly articulate what we ended up eating because I'm not entirely sure it would have satisfied the requirements of what we, you know, but we were starving. And uh, I feel like starvation, um, you know, accounted for, for certain things. Anyway, uh, we caught two little-ish fish and that was supposed to feed four of us. Um, and needless, needless to say, it, it, it didn't really go very far to filling our stomachs. And so we went to bed still kind of hungry. Well, that's all right. Tomorrow, you know, it'll be a new day. We can go out. Now, being the age that we were, there were certain things that if I did that trip now, I would check in advance. 
like the weather forecast, uh, that, that, that we didn't check in planning the trip, right? It was sunny the day we took off, and we just assumed that the sun would continue, um, even though it decided it wasn't going to, and at about 2 a.m. Uh, in the morning, what we suddenly woke up to was, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the storms that blow through the kind of Mount Everest and the tents like flapping down, it's almost flat. We were having one of those experiences where a storm had blown in overnight and um, we, we were like getting buffeted by this wind and we could almost hear the waves lapping against our tent. It was literally about a foot away from where we'd pitched our tent. The ocean was coming in and, and we, had, we were like, we had no idea what to do. So we're like building up sand barriers around our tent and wondering how we're going to get out of this and is this whole beach going to be covered in water and there's like cliff all around and we didn't know where we were going to go. Uh, and we didn't sleep a lot that night but we got through the storm and got up in the morning and although the storm had blown out the surf was now beyond what we would have called calm and so we were in this this kind of we were stuck because we're like look we could we could go for it in like four foot swell um or we could wait knowing we still don't have any food and we don't know when the ocean is going to get flat enough that we feel comfortable uh, sea kayaking with all our gear, uh, however many kilometres it was going to be back to the beach where we had left our car. Anyway, being, being the boys that we were and reckless that we were, we're like, Let's, let's risk it. Let's go for it, right? Because we're hungry. Food drives the stomach of young men, all right? This is our decision-making uh, is very highly related to how hungry we are. And so we're like, well, this will be fine. Like, we, we've surfed bigger than this. We'll just, it, it won't be a problem. As soon as we get over the, the, the shore breakers, uh, we'll be sweet. Anyway, so we packed everything up, packed it into our sea kayaks and, and nervously kind of to, to went out. And look, to, to cut a story short, Eventually, eventually, and the paddle was a whole lot longer on the way back with a whole lot more water, eventually we made it back to the beach that we had taken off from. Only uh, it was about four kilometres north of where our car was. Um, and so then we had the arduous journey of dragging full sea kayaks of equipment uh, that was wet and heavy down the sand dunes um, for about four kilometres to where our car was. Now, if, we, if we were hungry when, when we set off from the beach, we were starving by the time, like I'm talking, I was ready to eat whatever tree next presented itself. I was, I was so hungry. And because, again, we, haven't, we hadn't thought ahead enough to be like, it's going to be a great thing to have an esky full of food back at the car once we get there. The only thing we had in the car, and this was by chance, uh, was a single packet of sour cream and chive grain waves. That was the only thing that we had. And I am telling you, nothing has ever tasted better in my life than those uh, sour cream and chive grain waves. And even to this day, I will send a photo of a packet of those when I see them in the supermarket to that group because we all, there is just this agreement of, of satisfaction that we understand because of that moment, right? Like there was such a hunger and then there was just this, these grain waves. Now, who knows that sour cream and, ch uh, and chive grain waves are actually not that nutritious. Like, in terms of refueling us, they did not last long, okay? Not to mention you had four hungry 20-year-olds consuming this packet. And, and the reality is that nutritious or not, no matter what we eat, we get hungry again, right? Like, that story highlights the reality of the, the, the size of cravings that will drive us to things, but it also uh, kind of communicates the reality that as human beings, we're actually designed in a way that we will just get hungry again. Physically, we need consistent food, we need consistent water, and our body has been designed physiologically to let us know when we need those things, right? We have these feedback loops from our organs to our brain that tell us that, hey, you haven't had enough nutrient in a while, maybe have some food. Um, and that's what hungry feels like, or thirsty feels like, or sleep feels like. There's these, these things that our body lets us know when we're lacking and what we need. And if that is true physically, we must recognize that as human beings, we are not just physical. We are not just physical, right? Like, uh, it's very clear that we are 
physical and spiritual creations. There is as much a spiritual element to who we are as human. If we truly are made in the image of God, then there is an element of that that is not simply physical. In the same way that there is an element of God that is not just the physical Jesus, there is the Holy Spirit who is spiritual. So too, in our humanity, there is a spiritual element. And we have got to understand that the spiritual nature of us as humans has these similar cravings within it. And if we're not aware of that, then we, we miss the reality of actually what will satisfy some of the cravings that are so deep in some of us. You see, the truth is, that we were designed right, right from creation of the world. We were designed for communion with God. We were designed to have this relationship. We were designed to have this life with. Not, not, not that we would attend God every once in a while, but there was a life with God. God, that there was something within the spiritual nature of us as humans that required consistent connection with God. Just like we consistently need food and water, it's not that we didn't have it once and, you know, uh, it's a consistent thing. So too is the design of our spiritual nature to require consistency with God. And the truth is, and this is where we can get so off course, Christianity is not predominantly a religion. In fact, those who we would say founded Christianity, they didn't, fo- they didn't start a religion. They simply had an experience with Jesus that they wrote about because it so changed their life. It's, it's actually been those outside of that experience that looked on and said, something is going on that is beyond physical. It must be a spiritual thing. And so we're going to package that with the same label that we use for other people's journey of spirituality. But the difference is that what they had was they found relationships. They didn't find a religion. They found a relationship with Jesus Christ as their saviour and as the satisfying source of their soul. And we've labelled it incorrectly. And so we've gone after the wrong things to try to satisfy the spiritual cravings. And so instead of seeing it as a relationship, we see it as a religion. And so instead of pursuing Jesus, we pursue religion, religiosity, we pursue function. And so we think just going to church is going to satisfy our soul. But we go and we, sometimes we don't even connect with Christ. And we think ticking that box is somehow going to satisfy the, 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 the craving for connection. I believe one of the greatest images that we, we, we can use to understand how we are as, as Christians is actually that we're nothing more really than a well. We're nothing more than a well. We're, the scripture is... The, 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 Scripture describes us as a vessel. And we can fill ourselves up with, with all sorts of things. We, we actually we get to choose what we fill ourselves up with. And, but the result is what we fill ourselves up with, we're gonna, it's, it's actually what's going to be drawn out of us in interaction with people, right? So, so we're a vessel to be filled up. And ever since the garden, the truth is that humanity has been thirsty for connection with Christ. And when we, when we read this story, we, we see this woman, and, and if, you, if you spend time looking into it, she, she says in the passage I read at the start, do you think you're better than Jacob's well? And Jacob's well is an interesting term, right? Because Jacob's well is reference to something that happened way, 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 way back in the, the first book in the Bible, Genesis, right? And it was a well that Jacob dug to, to satisfy the physical needs of his, his huge family, right? And so actually, uh, when we read this passage, we have to understand that Jacob's well is referencing man's effort to satisfy himself. Right, Jacob. That's what Jacob's well represents, and 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 so even even here we get this insight into the the physical, actually really addressing the spiritual. You see, because the truth is that we are never satisfied by our, by our own attempts to satisfy the thirst that is deep within us. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, all we do is seek bigger and better, and more 
to try to satisfy our, our inner craving. You see, we just all we do is we keep going to Jacob's well. We just keep going to Jacob's well. We, we're aware that something in us is not right. There's this thirst. We, we find ourselves saying statements like, there's got to be more to life than this. Like, I'm just, something is just not right. You know, we describe it, I'm just not happy. I'm flat. Like, the truth is you're thirsty in your soul. That you've been designed with one and it thirsts and it hungers and there's only certain things that satisfy that. And too often we try to satisfy it by going to Jacob's well. And you know, the thing with Jacob's well, it's really interesting, right? Because for a, for a season, for a moment, for a, for a small period of time, when we satisfy the physical cravings that we have, it seems to drown out the fact that there's still a spiritual craving underneath. And so we think, we, we live in this misunderstanding that going to the physical is actually satisfying our soul. We buy into a deception that, that actually if I just went more often or if I, just, if I just did more, then it would end up actually at some point it is going to satisfy that inner craving that I still have. And the truth is that it's not. It's funny because you know what she says about the well? She says, this well is very deep. And this well is very deep. And, and you know the truth is that, that so, we, get, we get deep in so many things trying to satisfy. We get so deep into physical satisfaction in an attempt to satisfy the soul craving that we have in all of us. You want to know, you want to know how she knows that the well is deep? It's because in their initial conversation, Jesus says, hey, why don't... You know, we're about to talk about something really important right now. We're going to talk about how, how that craving on the, the inside of you is about to get satisfied. He says, so, so go get your husband. And he says, actually, the, the man you're living with right now, he's not your husband. And, and actually, you've had, you've had five. If you count all of the ones that he references, there's, there's five husbands prior to the man she's living with. So, so in effect, there's, this story it has, has, has six men in her life. And if you do any sort of study around numbers in Scripture, they can carry meaning. And six carries the meaning of man, right? It's like when we read uh, uh, about the number six, it's man's attempts. Man's attempts. And, and, and so it, it, here we have this incredible picture of another uh, image of man attempting to satisfy. She has been through six men attempting to satisfy the craving she has for value, for acceptance, for meaning, for purpose, for identity, the things that our soul is built on. And yet none of them, none of them have provided that for her. And I get this picture of this woman. I love, I love buying into the imagery in the scripture. And I get this image of this woman who, who's going out in the middle of the day to draw water. And I wonder how often do our physical behaviors actually demonstrate and reveal to us what's going on on the inside. You see, no, no woman in their right mind goes out in, in, in the desert in the middle of the day. That's like shelter time. That's like stay inside in the middle of the day. Like you don't even need to know scripture. You can watch Bear Grylls and know in the middle of the day you rest in the shade, right? Like you walk at night or early in the morning. You go outside when it's not baking hot. So, so just by knowing that she is out in the middle of the day uh, and having to, having to do a particular behavior because she still has physical needs, she still has to get the water. But the fact that she does it in a certain way tells us a whole lot about what's going on on the inside. And the truth is that, that sometimes if we took a moment to look at the way we were doing certain things in our life, we would realize that we were doing them because we were attempting to, to satisfy or to cover the fact that there was a whole lot more going on on the inside of us that maybe we're just not ready to acknowledge yet because we're afraid and we're scared that we don't know where to go to fix what is going on on the inside of us. And, and so we have this woman who's out in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the day, going to, to draw water. Why is she drawing water? She's drawing water for her, for her family. We don't know if she has children or not, but we certainly know that she's living with a man and he also needs to drink water because they live in the desert. Right? So we know that she is out there, not just for herself, but for, for someone else also. And, and we, I don't know that it's a long stretch of the bow to, 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 to consider that perhaps the reason she's out in the middle of the day is that she's ashamed 
of the things that she's done in the past, the, the five other men that she's been with, that she doesn't feel like she can go out with all of the other women. And so what we see demonstrated in her physical behavior is actually that she's dealing with incredible shame on the inside. And yet she still goes. So shame has not yet stopped her completely from doing the physical behavior. No, it's just changed it enough. Because, because the truth is she still, she still needs to bring water back for her husband. Because right now that's the only place that she's getting any sense of validation, any sense of value, any sense of appreciation, any sense of identity, any sense of worth. And so she still has to do that because, because she, she's bound to, to satisfy the, the physical requirements of life. It's just that it's telling us a whole lot about what's going on on the inside of her. And I wonder how many of us are stuck in physical behaviors because they temporarily satisfy you know, the deep craving that she has for worth and value is temporarily satisfied when her husband's like, oh, thanks for getting the water. I was really thirsty. That's awesome. Temporarily satisfied. But do you realize that even in our own physical relationships, they were never meant to be the things that satisfied our soul at the deepest level? We are supposed to be filled with a sense of value and security so that we can bring something into the relationship, not draw something out of the relationship. How many of us are seeking acceptance, value, worth, identity in relationships that aren't healthy for us or riches that are never going to be enough or, or, or experiences we crave the next experience because it gives us a high because ultimately we're lacking the joy that is only found when we are connected to the source of joy. So many of us, we just want to fit in. We just want to be liked. We just want to be known, to be wanted, to be valued, appreciated. Or we want to just know that we're living on purpose, that we have meaning to our life beyond just going to work or, 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 or dropping the kids at school. We want to know that there is something more to this life. It's interesting because, because Jesus is the seventh man in this story, right? If we make this story, you know, about... About the details, Jesus is the seventh man. And seven in scripture is the number of completion. Creation was completed in seven days. It was finished. It was done. That was the end. And then he rested. And so Jesus represents the end of her search, the completion of her search. Jesus represents the place that you do not have to keep going beyond. He is the point. He is the end. He represents the place in which she will find complete satisfaction. The, the temporary satisfaction that she has found in all these other men, or all these other relationships is actually found complete in the person of Jesus. You know, John, Se John 7 says this, this is on the last day of the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty, come to me. Anyone who believes in me. May come and drink, for the scriptures declare that rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And the truth is that right there is a picture of the Christian life. Rivers of living water flowing from you. Rivers of living water. Now let me be very clear, we cannot generate the spring ourselves. There is a requirement in, in, in the relationship that we seek the source. At some point, we have to recognize that we cannot give out beyond what we are connected to. Unfortunately, we teach ourselves the fact that good Christianity looks like A, B, C, and D. And so we continue to give out to satisfy what we believe is the requirement of good Christianity when all we're doing is draining out of the well that we are down to its deepest, deepest, dry depths because we are actually disconnected from the source of the river. We are not supposed to generate it. It's supposed to flow through us because of what we're connected to in the first place. He represents the end of the search, the source of satisfaction. He says, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain 
or in Jerusalem. It will no longer matter whether you do this or do that because, because your sense of value and worth and identity, your purpose and your meaning is not found. It's not satisfied in what you present. It's not satisfied in what you do. It's not satisfied in what you achieve. Its source of satisfaction is found in what your soul is genuinely connected to. And I see too many people who disconnect from Jesus and continue to try to be who they think they should or continue to try to do what they think they should and end up burned out and ready to throw religion and Jesus away when all he's doing is sitting on the well saying, if you would just come to me, just come to me. Is it the picture we get is that Jesus, the living spring, is sitting on top of the well, forever closing off the need to satisfy our spiritual cravings with physical, temporal uh, doings, whatever it is that you need to put in that box for you. Jesus, once and for all, sits on that and says, you don't need to access that anymore for satisfaction. You come to me. You come to me. And let's be, let's be really clear and honest right now that Christianity first begins connected to Jesus and never moves beyond that. Let, 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 let's understand that it never moves beyond our connection with Him. He is the source of life and peace and joy and purpose and meaning. And I'm telling you, if you're lacking those things in your life, you don't need to search for them somewhere out in, in the physical achievement of life or in the accolades that come. No, you need to find yourself going back to the spring of living water. so easy to read scripture if we've been in church for any length of time it's so easy to read it and believe that somehow in that story we're anything but the woman <laughs> okay so we think we think we move beyond being the woman but the truth is i'm the woman at the well so often I find myself time and time again still trying to satisfy the the inner thirst that I know develops with all sorts of other things like, let's not pretend somehow we've moved beyond this. Like, the church is the woman at the well. Oh, lo and behold, I fear a day where the church believes it moves beyond requiring connection with Jesus. Like, if we ever read this story and don't realize we are the woman at the well, the church is the woman at the well, every believer is the woman at the well. If we think that, that we can do the life that Christ really has for us, you know, the, the, the life that Christians talk about, this amazing, incredible, the, we cannot do that without the source of all of it flowing through us. We don't generate it on ourselves. No, we allow it to, to flow first, spring up, bubble up. We must remain connected to the spring of life himself. So We so need Christ. We don't, Hear me in this, and let's not misquote this, but we don't actually need the function of the church. We need connection with Christ. There is incredible things that come from the function of the church when connection with Christ is in the middle of it. But if we first seek function, then all we're doing is asking Jesus, hey, is it this mountain or is it that temple? And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. It's, it's me. It's here with me. It's, 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 about, it's about abiding, it's about, it's about connecting, it's about remaining, it's about, it's about the spring of living water in us. For us? No. To flow out of us? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't, look, I don't know where you're at this morning. You might be watching this some other day, some other time. But I, I feel very strongly that so many people watching this are realizing that they are right where they, the woman at the well was, where she has an inner thirst that is not getting satisfied by all of the physical things that she is trying to do, all of the relationships that she is trying to gain it from, all of the achievement that she is trying to get it from. And I want to tell you right now that I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray that in this moment you open yourself up honestly to the person of Jesus, that you refine what it is to connect with him in, a, in an authentic and a genuine and a real way. So Father, right now, 
wherever someone is listening to this message, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work drawing them back to you. God, I pray right now, wherever they're watching, they would have such an incredible, real sense that you are right there with them. Lord, I pray for joy to be unlocked in people. I pray for peace to flood over people's minds. I pray right now for people to have a a, a real experience of you. But most of all, I pray that from this, we would commit to seeking the source. That we would commit to being a people that are about Him. And then let Him show us what that means.